Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Federica Barone, and um, she will talk about physics in from neural networks for modeling power transformers, dynamic thermal behavior. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for saying it. I don't have to say it anymore. That's nice. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation for, like, uh, and for inviting me here. I'm uh, very happy to present my work. Uh, actually, this is a, I'm a PhD student at uh, KTH, the Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And, uh, but uh, I'm going to present a work that I've been uh, uh, conducted last year for my master thesis mainly and a uh, little bit uh, after. And, Let's start. Let's see. Uh, okay. uh, I will start to give an overview of uh, physics in formula networks in the sense that uh, where do they come from? Uh, the seminal paper uh, was given by uh, Professor Raisi, Pradikaris, and Kanyadakis uh, around 2019. And uh, what I would like to highlight here is that uh, these topics started uh, since 2019 to explode, uh, given the uh, uh, the fact that uh, just this paper was cited uh, by uh, 3,489 uh, uh, other articles or works, so which I think is incredible in three years. Uh, and uh, of course, not all the works are good. I hope mine will be good enough. But uh, this is, uh, is, I think, it's a very promising uh, uh, part of the machine learning, and uh, it's uh, very new. So a lot of research will be is still conducted and a lot of things are to be found, uh, but uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, thing. Uh, thing. And um, the key point that I would like for you to bring home today from my work is that uh, what we be, why we are using things is to investigate if uh, their usage is actually makes sense in our uh, application, which is like analyzing the behavior of the the thermal behavior of uh, power transformers. Yes. Uh, okay, it's missing some parts, but uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit. Uh, so there were some uh, uh, um, arrows, yes, going from one side to the other. Just to imagine them. Uh, it's, uh, so this is the project overview. So what the uh, we're focusing on power components, particularly in this case power transformers. We have data. Uh, there are uh, uh, time series of uh, two different temperatures, in this case, top oil temperature and ambient temperature. And this is a factor, but I will explain that uh, in the next slides what they are. We have data. The idea is to use them to um, uh, plug them in in some sort of physics and, and informal uh, models that uh, include some machine learning. and. Uh, Specifically, in this case, it would be physics informed neural networks. And out of these models, so like take out the results and uh, to give some sort of maintenance of the uh, power components, um, in the sense that um, uh, to maybe like uh, reuse certain parts of all the components, or in the case of uh, like after like so, some sort of degradation, and uh, uh, or maybe replace a part of a um, still new uh, power transformer. What are power transformers in Max? Uh, maybe, uh, I think uh, all of you probably already seen a power transformer, but maybe I didn't know this then. <laughs> and and uh, that was me like, two years ago, like less than two years ago. Um, that's a, uh, okay, I'm going to try this. Okay, yes, this is uh, just an image of a power transformer. They are very important components. Uh, uh, because uh, they, uh, they guarantee some efficient uh, transmission and the distribution of electricity over long distances. Yeah. And they do so by uh, raising the voltages closer to the, uh, the power production sites and the lowering closer to our house and uh, closer to the consumers in general. And uh, they need to guarantee certain accuracy and, uh, and they need to uh, survive and like, to, be, uh, to have a long lifetime, which is usually, I would say, around 30, 40 years, uh, even though they should be even more, although uh, with different temperatures that they experience, it, that's uh, the problem. So, in fact, this is uh, why we're uh, focusing on this, uh, this part more, like uh, about the temperature distribution that they experience inside of that. It's also affected by the outside uh, uh, temperatures. And uh, the thermal behavior is one of the key focus uh, areas for manufacturers. Um, 
and uh, the thermal modeling uh, remains uh, one of the main uh, areas uh, to be studied in the in the, this uh, case. Oh yeah, missing one, but it's okay. Uh, so and I will uh, explain a bit the background, uh, the problem. <coughs> Uh, <laughs> the of uh, transformer thermal performance is the top oil temperature. Uh, okay, I'm missing, I hope I'm not missing more after because uh, this can be a problem. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, I'm missing all the equations, so I'm actually worried for, for later, but we'll see. Uh, should I? Uh, I don't. Okay, yeah, I'm screwed. Uh, I need to stop. <laughs> now I have to see how to fix this. Uh, Sorry for the interruption, but now we'll try more. It's fine. Better than I did it. I think I was somewhere here, but okay. To summarize, okay. The background of the, of the problem. So we are uh, interested in uh, the thermal performance of this uh, power transformers. And the one of the indicator of uh, this uh, performance is the top oil temperature, this TO. And uh, the top oil temperature is a function of the uh, ambient temperature, PA, and the log factor K. Um, the conventional uh, dynamic thermal models that uh, they use uh, like, uh, for now, uh, they have like parameters for rated conditions that are uh, determined uh, empirically by, uh, during the factory test. And uh, the, the models include the effects of uh, the load factor and ambient temperature direction. So here we have um, just um, an example of uh, um, of uh, like 100 hours in time, and uh, we have the time series for ambient temperature, the blue line, and the top oil temperature, the, the red line, and uh, the, this green, uh, sorry, uh, gray uh, area is the load factor, and uh, we can see that this uh, green uh, dotted line is uh, this uh, IEC standard uh, model that we are not really interested in now, but uh, basically this is one of these models that uh, use uh, the information of the load factor and ambient temperature and the predicted top oil temperature, so we can see it a bit that he uh, actually uh, sees the behavior, so like when it goes down and up of the top of the temperature, but there's still quite big errors, so we want to improve this. And moreover, uh, this type of model does not conserve any energy and it does not uh, provide any temperature distribution in between uh, these, uh, these uh, values. So we opted for a more physical model, and uh, for this uh, we um, uh, the heat diffusion equation for now, a uh, very simple, uh, uh, simple model in, the, in this sense. And uh, here we can see the, the equation in the 3D. However, it started even more simple. We started with a 1D uh, uh, model uh, that we can uh, uh, see here. And uh, more specifically, here we have our equation again. Um, we are uh, modeling along the height of the transformer. So here, Another very simplification of our power transformer along the height. Uh, we can see that we have our uniform heating, our Q, that is like heating like uh, horizontally um, along the height of the transformer, and uh, it's uh, represented by this uh, equation here. So it's specifically like designed for our problem. So it's a uh, uh, sum of two losses, and uh, like the, we are uh, subtracting some. Uh, Convective heat uh, transfer. So, what's uh, um, another particular part of our problem is that uh, we have uh, we set up our uh, time series of ambient temperature and top oil temperature as our boundary conditions. So, at the bottom we have an ambient temperature and top uh, top oil temperature. So, we have our data that it's us just this time series that I already mentioned. And moreover, we have uh, values that are all known in uh, in our heat source. Uh, another thing I would like to uh, highlight at this point is uh, this uh, value here, the load loss and the ambient temperature. There are values that depend on time, and uh, you will see soon enough, quite, quite soon, the, why they are important to, to keep in mind. But uh, yeah, so why are we using pins? Uh, pins are uh, uh, they are like a model that can mainly solve the two uh, problems. The first one is the data-driven solution of PDEs, so it's basically just a forward problem. It's uh, solving our PDE given some fixed parameters. In our case, it would translate to model the temperature distribution inside the power transformer with the values that uh, 
that are all known as uh, you saw in the previous slide. Um, then the data-driven discovery of PDEs. Um, so this is just the inverse problem. Uh, we want uh, we have uh, um, we have like data, so we want to uh, calibrate uh, like the, the parameter fit the parameters uh, um, compared to the data that the measurements that we have. And in this case, uh, uh, would be to uh, improve the physical description of the thermal behavior of the, of the, of the power transformers. And finally, an addition that I think is very relevant in this, uh, in this area is also prediction because uh, a set of pieces on machine learning. So I think it should be, it's important to exploit the, uh, their usage in, uh, in this area as well, so to predict the future values of, uh, in this case, of, of, uh, of the temperature, given previous temperature and about factor uh, values. The right part is that uh, should appear now, but yeah. So this is the, the, the one I will talk about uh, uh, now. Uh, mainly, uh, we are investigating the second and third part as well, but uh, this is still working progress. So, uh, and uh, yes, so physics and formula networks. Uh, we already had a bit of an introduction, I think, uh, on Monday, uh, but I will uh, explain a bit uh, more. In general, and specifically for our problems, what they are and what uh, um, like what is important about them. Um, first of all, um, I will uh, interchangeably use this notation. So U and uh, capital T is just the, our solution of the PDE, so the temperature distribution. So we set our function, uh, so our PDE, just written here, uh, to be our function f, our residual. And uh, okay, so first. Let's focus on the, uh, this part. This is our neural network. We train our neural network uh, by uh, using the boundary conditions. So this is the uh, first key point. We input the space and time, and uh, we train. We have like a sort of um, yeah, some hidden layers and one of your neurons. So it's not a very deep uh, machine learning. Uh, so it's. Uh, you will see there are actually quite small uh, uh, architectures. And then uh, let's focus on first on the first output. Uh, just forget about these two for now. Um, this is our uh, approximation of the solution at these uh, coordinates that we are uh, training on, so we, that we have uh, as inputs. And the, here comes the second part of the, of the theme. So we are evaluating our solution um, and uh, we are calculating the, the partial derivatives uh, with respect to time and space, uh, as uh, we are interested in, in this case. And uh, um, to do so, like we evaluate uh, this, uh, this PDE at certain uh, collocation points. What are the collocation points? Like in, uh, in the region of interest, so in space and time, we are taking same random in this case, um, the points at which we are evaluating the PDE. And, uh, and then like we have uh, the, the, our function f, and uh, it's important to to highlight uh, our loss function here because uh, uh, it's given by the sum of different loss functions. In, in particular, the mean square error of uh, uh, the actually see here of our solution u, uh, and uh, that we can actually uh, train because we have the information and the boundary conditions in this case. And uh, uh, of our function f here that we want to minimize it to a reach uh, zero to be equal to zero. Now it comes to the other two outputs why they're there. Uh, this is uh, what we found to be uh, one of the peculiarities of our um, work, especially uh, last year. Now it's a bit maybe appreciated, I would say, but uh, yeah, it's like uh, obsolete. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because. Uh, Mm, these values, as I was saying, they depend on time, and we have data that it's taken hourly. However, these collocation points that I was saying when we, we evaluate the PDE, um, they are taken semi randomly, meaning that maybe we have points that are in between the hours. And uh, what do we do with these uh, values is like if we don't have information between the hours? And uh, we thought there's a like, first way to tackle this problem to approximate them um, by the neural network because we could actually set up a, a mean square error for both of these values and then uh, uh, train because we have uh, actual values for these, uh, for these uh, actual measurements for them and we can train uh, the, the mean square error for both of them and then uh, plug them in into the function much more easily than uh, um, 
just in using the measurements themselves because it was uh, quite impossible <laughs> at this point. Um, okay, so a bit about the model structure, so a bit about the, like, the hyperparameter tunings. Uh, I'm not going to go too much in deep on this, but uh, I think what uh, it's interesting to notice is the number of boundary training data. It says that, uh, as I said, we train using the, uh, the boundaries, the boundary points, and uh, we, have, uh, we used 100 points in time, meaning that we had 100 points for the, the boundary condition at the bottom and 100 points at the uh, boundary condition at the top, uh, giving out uh, a total of 200 points. Out of this, we took batches of 50, uh, 100 and 150 points. And it is interesting because it shows that PIMS does not need the whole uh, training points that you have, have available, but it works sufficiently well with uh, even less points. And this is also computationally uh, less expensive, I would, uh, I would say. Then uh, we have a different uh, collocation points we tried. The activation function uses the hyperbolic tangent, and the optimizer is uh, LBFGSP. Uh, second order um, optimizer. And uh, finally, uh, we have to test our model somehow. We don't have an analytical solution because it's a very applied uh, equation. So we uh, also calculated the, um, the solution using a final volume method with the discretization in space of uh, 50 nodes and then um, just 100 points in time. So we took the hours uh, um, given by the data set. And before jumping to the results, I wanted to show also this slide because uh, maybe it's not representing much for you, but uh, it's, um, it's quite interesting as well because, uh, first of all, we can see that the values are very large. Uh, and uh, they, um, I divided them into real values because they are the ones more close to the real world data for our transformers. And uh, they are just coefficients uh, because uh, in power transformers we have also convection that is not really included well in the heat diffusion equation. And then maybe you are not seeing why are you using, using the heat diffusion equation. We have to start to somewhere uh, a little bit easier uh, because otherwise we would have to use another Stokes uh, equation in 3D. And uh, it, it's a bit uh, too much to start uh, at that. But yeah, so we have manually uh, adjusted uh, this coefficient k and h, especially the k was supposed to be lower than this. Uh, the H as well has to be multiplied by some area, but yeah, not too much in details on this, uh, just uh, there to be adjusted. And, uh, and then uh, to scale the data, I scaled each parameter by one factor of 1,000 because otherwise the optimizer was uh, going like crazy. And they was not able to, to even like, see the, uh, the performance very well. So the results. Um, Okay, so we train, uh, sorry, we use the 100 points in time. Um, here we can see uh, the architecture a bit, so we use the 100 training points uh, for the boundary conditions instead of 200, and 10,000 collocation points. The architecture is very small compared to a neural neural network for, for, for even layers and 15 euros, and uh, these are the errors achieved. So uh, for the uh, temperature distribution, the relative L2 error is still maybe quite large compared to maybe other uh, results found also in literature. But uh, in general, like we see that the PINS is performing already very well, like giving a, a good solution of the, of the problem, uh, finding like the, the warmer spots and, the, and the, it's, it's in general like a very good uh, uh, satisfactory uh, result for, uh, for us. Um, we also analyzed a little bit uh, more in details. I won't uh, describe too much uh, like uh, details, like how we um, found this reference solution is more like a finer mesh of the numerical method, but uh, I think uh, what it's important to notice here, first of all, we analyzed the error, uh, the uh, root mean square error between uh, this reference solution and this uh, uh, that we define to be uh, the closest uh, uh, to the analytical solution and the team. And uh, the error was uh, given to be uh, four, uh, around 4.8 Kelvin. And uh, um, another uh, 
like the reflections that uh, I think are important to to, to look at and, uh, at this point is uh, this figure where we actually see the absolute error between uh, each point uh, of the reference solution and the pin, uh, and we can see that uh, um, pins like are more accurate at the boundaries, which is more expected, and also more accurate at the, the lower temperature uh, uh, areas, which uh, is very interesting for us because we're interested in the temperature and especially the warmer temperatures because that's where uh, problems usually arise and uh, we really want to uh, analyze those points and uh, uh, know what's going on uh, because maybe like it gets very warm and uh, uh, it's important to control those, uh, those parts. Um, and finally, been as uh, shown in general could like to potentially work better than uh, an American method. Uh, this work was not to show off that pin is better than American methods. We we know that uh, uh, in these situations, like uh, a final color method and American method uh, is uh, is already working very well. It was just to see if uh, um, it could work in a, in a, first of all in a more applied uh, uh, situation, and uh, we think uh, and uh, we also quite proved in the last year, uh, I can't show you much more than this, but uh, we put that in general, in more complex scenarios, uh, it can work better, and uh, it can, we can exploit more um, their usage in ear post problems, for example, so in case we have data that is uh, more scattered around the areas, in case instead of like boundary conditions, but also in the, for me also, I think it's important to use it for prediction of the future value, but, uh, which is something that we started to work on and I think the results are already very interesting. And uh, this brings me to a bit of some conclusions on uh, what I try to uh, show you today. So uh, what we uh, had some problems it was uh, to insert this uh, uh, ambient temperature and the load loss in the physical function because uh, they depend on time and uh, Back then, when I didn't know anything about this model and uh, uh, I didn't know anything about power transformers either, and I still don't know so much, but that's another um, side. It's uh, I, I it, like the way we tackled the problem was very like for us was uh, super uh, uh, super good. Uh, as far as today, like we actually found out other ways to tackle this problem uh, instead of maybe using it. Um, as a, as a output, so we are using them as inputs, so we actually can exploit the, the information and the measurements, also because we actually have measurements, so why are they not using them? Um, understanding when pins should be used instead of a numerical method, uh, pins are able to leverage uh, existing measurements, and uh, I think it's really, uh, it's important to analyze more like the, both like the positive and also negative part mm -hmm. of pins. It's a new method, so like of course it's not going to be the uh, substituting numerical methods, but uh, I think it's interesting just to analyze what they are doing. I think it's very, very cool that they're actually solving PDEs just uh, by not like writing uh, by hand what uh, uh, the solution is. And then uh, usage of measurements from a real transformer rather than synthetic data. That's also quite challenging because uh, they're using measurements that uh, might have noise and. Uh, it's not always so straightforward to, to see like the, the results uh, uh, when uh, when you have real real uh, uh, measurements. Today's reflection means that in the last year what we have been doing kind of um, we first used TensorFlow One, which is like where the seminar paper was. Uh, uh, they actually gave the code, so I used the I the code and and we changed uh, uh, concerning our problem. Today we are using TensorFlow Two, which uh, allows us to use much more different uh, 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 tools that uh, and we are able to analyze much better. Scaling of the equations, so pins face uh, difficulties to handle large parameters. Uh, yes, like I had to scale, but of course it's much better to use uh, uh, the dimensionless form of the equation just do it uh, directly. And uh, it's, uh, I, I think I had to kind of. Um, um, Quite like um, uh, I was rushing and I had to scale somehow, and that was like the quickest way. So do that. <laughs> I mean, it was very good for this way, but uh, it's not always so lucky. And then using the ambient temperature and the loss as inputs of the neural network rather than uh, uh, 
output as I was already mentioning. And uh, I would like to thank you. If you have questions, please go ahead. We have a website that um, we are not always uh, updating, but um, yeah, it gives like a bit of uh, insight of what we do and uh, who we are, like our super my, mainly my supervisor has created. Um, I would like to thank some of our sponsors, and um, these are the papers that we published in the last year. So thank you so much for listening, and sorry for <laughs> taking longer than needed. <laughs> optimizer that you are using, which is the second order one, uh, LDFGSP type B. What is exactly the boundary that uh, uh, make you uh, very interested in using a second order optimizer instead of Adam? And beside of this question, um, did you try with Adam as well for solving your problem and what was the difference between? Yeah, so I'll, okay. Again, unlikely this is a work I've done that last year, and um, um, yes, when I did it, I think I, I just uh, took things as, okay, this is uh, the stuff that has been used, so this was the optimizer that uh, was used like, from uh, all the literature. It has been proved to be work better for convergence, however, for some problems, it's actually good to use uh, Adam for the, like, uh, certain epochs and then uh, uh, switch to to, uh, to the second order uh, to, to not get stuck in some uh, not a minima. Uh, mm -hmm. We used it and I think uh, it worked uh, better for some um, different um, yeah uh, tries out that we did. Uh, it's a work that another master student uh, did that I keep something in my work because I'm not actually working on this anymore. <laughs> I mean I'm working on things but I'm not working on the uh, on this application, uh, although I'm following it. So it did try and uh, actually get uh, some, some good results to, to train first with Adam and then uh, uh, use a more powerful tool as a DM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, it might, it might be LBFG, LBFGS uh, without the thing, but uh, I, I would have to check again. And, no, no, no. I, I, uh, I know about LPFGS. It's exactly something that I'm working on that. Okay. LPFGS. No, yeah, this yeah, I don't know if it's like LPFGS B, or, or with FIGMA. LB, uh, LPFGS is true. And uh, it's type B that solved the prop, uh, constraint problem. Yeah, exactly. It solved the constraint exactly. problem. But LPFGS solved uh, yeah, exactly. the constraint yeah. problem. But, but I, I, I was interested in knowing what's exactly your a constraint uh, or boundary constraint that you uh, use this optimizer? I only say I used it more as a, I took it as a path and I, I, I got not an alignment okay. so I didn't focus too much on optimizing the optimizer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I know for a fact that usually it's bad, or not always but it is. Yes, it yes. depends on the bound background. Like, I don't know. Uh, recently, we had the keynote speaker uh, invited our uh, latest um, FIMO workshop, uh, Professor Takac, and uh, he mentioned that for uh, physics based uh, problem, second order optimizer yeah. works better than yeah. first order one, such as Adam. And uh, so it makes sense that for a few of uh, epochs, you use the Adam to be yeah. close to exactly. Optima and yeah. then. Exactly. Like to, to, to not get uh, stuck. Yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so any other question? Yeah, just a quick question. So when you said about the, the problem of large parameters, that probably yeah. uh, just just a curiosity. Is it like the QB scale? You you think it's going to be easier, or is it something related to the PD? Like for example, that uh, maybe the if, if the diffusion is more important than the, than the source term. Actually, this is the, I mean, uh, I don't know if someone of you spotted it, uh, but uh, I don't have time maybe to talk about it, but uh, like, uh, it's actually interesting because I scaled more one of the parameters mm -hmm. than the others, which is not good. <laughs> and uh, I noticed that, I know, okay, it's wrong. Uh, which, uh, um, and that we are analyzing much more about this. Uh, 
and uh, it's interesting because uh, when we usually when we actually put the real uh, uh, PD, things are not able to uh, to solve the the, the PD, and um, we have to tackle this problem with different uh, that some in literature that they just posted like different uh, ways to, to do this, and uh, there's this uh, method called curriculum learning. And, uh, don't know if I'm even be able to actually, but it's basically to increase this parameter um, for, it, for different uh, batches of epochs. And, um, but yes, technically, uh, yeah. Because I wonder if it's like related yeah. to some kind of dimensional parameter, for me it's like, a, like the Reynolds number, like the 58 number, maybe in this yeah. case. Then uh, if it's, it's too large, then the PD cannot work. And it's, it's still a thing that, uh, uh, it's very interesting to see that I um, mean uh, this, and uh, of course like this uh, equation is very similar to the real one. That's why like the, the results are very similar. Of course, they're not right, uh, um, but uh, it's interesting to analyze why this is not working. And it's a it's a it's a lot of research on this, uh, and, uh, but definitely if you use it, I mean, to use the dimension as well because uh, it's, uh, uh, but it, it's a it's a very good. Uh, to see why. Yeah, sorry, maybe I'm too late. <laughs> okay, last question. Uh, just a question. Uh, after uh, when you show how the neural network works, I don't want to. Uh, there. Uh, I didn't understand how to evaluate the derivatives uh, because you get the value of u, but after that, uh, how do you get the value of the derivatives? You get the uh, yes, yeah, so sorry. <coughs> Uh, yeah, sorry, I think I tried to rush a bit too much and I was meant to say uh, automatically differentiation in, uh, in tensor flow. So okay. I just, uh, uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you again.